on how to address their business challenges using data and technology. So with that, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to Dave. Great, thanks Tracy, I appreciate it. You know, I think that the topic that we're going to discuss today, specifically around establishing a business case for investment in BI in analytics, has always been relevant. And I think it's gonna become even more relevant as more and more companies realize they need access to a wide variety of data, uh, especially in times of crisis, and also need to ensure that investments will bring a financial benefit to their organizations. So with that in mind, we're gonna keep the agenda today really simple. After establishing the need for BI in analytics is growing, it is more important today than it ever has been. I'll present four paradigms on how to think about positioning BI and analytics as a driver of business value. And along the way, we'll look at a few case studies. And then we'll wrap up with some specific and actionable suggestions for building a business case in your organization. So the intent here today is really to help support you advance the usage of an investment in BI and analytics in your companies and your organizations by compiling information that decision makers really should be looking for. And certainly if we fall short of that here today, reach out and let's talk about your situation one-on-one. -on -one. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Analytics 8, we're a services firm that's focused exclusively on analytics. We work on things like data strategy and data architecture, enterprise reporting, data visualization, and even data science and advanced analytics. We've been around for over 15 years and we take really an agnostic approach to tools and technology within the field of analytics. Um, and we've helped over 700 companies get more value out of their data. So as we talked about, we're gonna talk a bit about the difficulty in selling data in, in analytics and what some of the, the best practices are to do that. So we know that the demand for BI continues to grow, continues to be important and critical as organizations operate in this climate. There's more and more data that's accessible to companies, and we know that companies are actually increasing their spend on BI and analytics. That's been stated by Forbes and Gartner and Forrester you know, after they've done uh, significant research in that area. We also know that more than ever, advanced capabilities are both more powerful these days and more approachable as they're being built into open source libraries, as well as embedded into some kind of best practice or leading BI tools. Additionally, the availability of compute resources uh, are, you know, are more and more prevalent today than they ever have been. And finally, we know that colleges and, and universities are graduating more well-educated, data-capable graduates uh, through their data science programs and analytics programs. Those are becoming more and more popular. So the workforce is getting more capable, more intelligent, more savvy with respect to working with data. And yet there's a challenge internal to many organizations in that data and analytics could be kind of a hard sell. So it's, it's easy to speak to the inherent business benefits, things like you know, getting more data in the hands of more users or making decisions faster. Those are of course great benefits, but they're difficult to quantify. And part of the reason why they're difficult to quantify is that the benefits of using data in analytics are oftentimes a, a step or two removed from the actual business benefit. So just because something is a good idea doesn't mean that it'll be profitable for the company. It doesn't mean that it'll be beneficial to the organization's members or constituents. And so we try to move beyond 
just an idea being subjectively good uh, to being objectively good. And that comes from, in part at least, trying to anticipate the impact of the solution by calculating the financial benefit. So in order to combat the difficulty, I guess, of tying a business benefit to analytics initiatives, we have to be able to build and speak to the business case. That, that's absolutely critical. So most healthy organizations are willing to invest in initiatives that will bring a positive return on investment or ROI. This includes businesses of all sizes, even nonprofits, educational institutions, and, and even government organizations. But there's an effective way to win support, and there's plenty of ineffective ways. So if you think about it, would, would your boss or leader, would decision makers in your organization rather have you come to them with business challenges and questions and problems, or maybe lofty promises about a conceptual technical solution? Or would they rather have you come to them with a rational projection about the solution's business value? Certainly, we expect that it's the last of those three options that would be, uh, that would gain the most support and, and leaders would be most receptive to. Unless we can talk in the language of those decision makers, it's difficult to gain that buy-in or to build the coalition uh, to support maybe the data culture that we're trying to build out or the, the solution that we think would, would make a big difference to the organization. So people like maybe the, the CFO or a PMO office, maybe a procurement team, or just generally you know, upper management, maybe it's the boss, maybe it's a couple levels above, um, you know, those who make significant spending decisions. So BI has potential application all over the enterprise and for organizations of all sizes. The question is whether we can tie directly the business benefits or the financial impact to the BI or analytics effort. So a lot of times when we work with our clients, we, we hear them talking about BI or thinking about BI and analytics as a tactical solution. So something like, you know, Mary in marketing needs to see a report on how the most recent email campaign performed against customer segments, or maybe it's Frank in finance who needs to see a projection on how a new product will impact sales in the next quarter. Our perspective is that an ROI on those requests doesn't really exist. But BI can be strategic to organizations when they think about leveraging BI and analytics to improve their business, not just to answer tactical questions or provide historical data. So the possibilities here are really endless because what we're trying to do is just help the organization become smarter by relying on data, at least partially, to make better decisions. Okay, so there's a lot of good ideas um, that, that exist across an organization. So what does it look like then to begin to put those into financial terms? Well, let's look at a few examples here. So say an organization has multiple BI tools that are in use. Maybe one is supported officially by the IT group and another has gained some popularity in a business unit that you know, may have a shadow IT uh, component to it. So if the organization then decides to align on one of those tools and make a single tool, it's a strategic BI tool, we're gonna eliminate maintenance or subscription fees, which are due annually. And that could be thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars for the company annually. We're gonna eliminate server or hosting costs, which again could be in the thousands of dollars annually. And finally, we're expecting to reduce some labor effort as well. 
uh, which could be in the thousands of dollars. So pretty significant amount of money that we're talking there. If we think about automating a manual business process, you know, we're going to reduce potentially significant effort. Um, you know, over the course of a year, you know, in the, ex the example here, which is hypothetical, but you know, if an employee was making, you know, cost the organization uh, fifty dollars an hour, say, and we replaced a business process, a manual business process, uh, with a report or uh, a dashboard. Um, you know, maybe we reduce four hours a week over the course of a year. That employee would then end up, or the organization would end up saving over ten thousand dollars. Or another example is improving the quality of leads. So if an organization is converting at a rate of, or you know, if we improve the conversion rate by two percent, and that rate is a thousand customers per month, you know, at fifty dollars a sale, that's going to be you know, over twelve thousand dollars. And so we're we're talking real money here with some of these opportunities. Um, and so I think you know, being able to communicate that to business leaders, we're going to expect to, to be able to get their attention and hopefully get their support. So let's take a look at the four different models of uh, potential business cases for BI. And the first one is looking at reducing costs in IT. So this is one of the most approachable places to start in terms of quantifying the financial return of data and analytics. So things like maybe reducing hosting fees by shutting down servers that are not needed outside of business hours, or maybe considering a reserved pricing model instead of on-demand for workloads that run full-time. You know, those are some opportunities where, where we've helped clients uh, just simply reduce their cost within IT. We talked about consolidating BI tools, but another opportunity would be automating some data aggregation and maybe the, you know, automating the report sharing effort. If we rely on tools to do that or build that into an automatic process instead of the manual effort required, that's gonna save hours. And if we're saving hours, that means we're also saving dollars for the organization. A lot of times moving to the cloud is an opportunity for, um, for companies to, to save money. Also, if we certify reports, we're ensuring that the data that is appearing on those reports is valid. It's been, uh, it's been validated, it's been tested, it's been proven. And so we reduce any of the effort related to having to validate that re report anytime it's updated. Um, that could be a potential uh, effort saver as well. Uh, and then you know, anytime that we're moving to a new platform, we're bringing on a new tool, um, we can potentially leverage the vendor for additional software support, maybe quicker responses and, and faster fixes. Uh, so again, we're reducing effort in that sense. So reducing costs is a simple way to measure the ROI. Uh, since costs are known to the organization and reducing costs is always gonna be a benefit. Also, a lot of times, IT, or if not always, you know, IT is considered a cost center to an organization. Uh, and so cutting costs is very approachable and, and certainly in line with how organizations think about IT. So one of the organizations that we worked with is Trendline Interactive, and they provide end-to-end -end email marketing solutions for big companies, for Fortune 1000 companies. Now they're based in Austin, Texas, and they're you know, private equity owned. Now they had an old system that was holding them back and really costing them a, a frustratingly large amount of money. You know, at the end of the project, we realized that what we were able to reduce um, from their old system and moving them to a new one, um, you know, ultimately saved them over $130,000 annually. Uh, so that's, again, that's real money. That's, that's impactful. Um, that's an impactful project. Uh, and that's, you know, resources then that the company is able to, uh, to reallocate and, and use a bit more intelligently, a bit more strategically. So moving from IT to different business units, um, 
reducing manual effort, again, is a, is a great way to reduce costs. So if we eliminate the effort to, um, you know, of, of analysts to search for and maybe combine and rationalize data throughout multiple spreadsheets or multiple sources, and we eliminate the effort of them sending those spreadsheets out via email, that could save countless hours across an organization. Not to mention the effort saved in validating data. So a lot of modern BI tools allow sharing and collaboration within the tool itself. And so again, instead of collab or instead of combining spreadsheets and emailing those out and getting conversations going via email, you know, some modern BI tools can manage most of that process uh, just within the tool. So, and, and even a tool, which is not a new concept, such as a parameter, uh, parameterized dashboard to consolidate similar data in one place, it reduces time chasing down answers to follow-up questions. We can also look to automate decisions that are based on metric heuristics or rules of thumbs. Uh, so for example, maybe, I don't know, a, you know, a variance over a predetermined acceptable amount on a supplier invoice. Maybe that triggers additional scrutiny for that vendor. Uh, so we're you know, removing the thought process of, of having to um, you know, make that decision and replacing it with that heuristic uh, that you know, serves as kind of that, uh, that line or that decision maker in terms of what types of actions we take. And of course, I mean, all, all this time saved means that employees will be better able to focus on higher value tasks. And as a side benefit, hopefully increase their job satisfaction in the process. That's always a good thing. So uh, there's a biotech firm that we work for uh, that had come to work on a bloated Excel-based solution that had evolved for them over the period of um, you know, really fast growth, um, but that ultimately required some uh, significant manual intervention on a weekly basis. So you know, not only did it require significant effort, but it meant their executives were really working with outdated information. So it's always good to get information to users uh, especially if those users are executives, but ultimately the financial case is tied to that reduction in manual effort. Um, and so, you know, we've saved them in this example you know, over $25,000 just based on that time savings. Uh, again, that's real effort, it's real money, and it's impactful for organization and certainly builds goodwill among executives and across the organization for the possibilities or the, the benefits of working with data and uh, working with, um, with BI. Okay, so you know, moving beyond some of the tactical cost savings that by definition will always be limited uh, because the, the, um, you know, the, the cost savings that they bring will be limited um, just because there's, there's only you know, X amount that we're actually spending on those um, you know, on those processes or on those solutions. So we can look to broader initiatives that affect the organization's balance sheet. Uh, so there's tons of promise for improvement through analytics there. So good places to start are use cases with the highest potential. So uh, those that relate to customer or maybe those that relate to an organization's product or offerings to the market or optimizing the, you know, the biggest expense for most organization, which maybe it's inventory, maybe it's labor, or it's their supply chain or logistics. Um, so those, those are the, the types of categories, the types of areas that we wanna look to if we, we really wanna knock it out of the park with respect to building a business case and impacting the business positively through data and analytics. So there's, there's opportunities in customer service. So like maybe we get the customer lifetime value score into the hands of representatives to ideally encourage some upsell opportunities. 
or maybe a market basket analysis or kind of next best product uh, type of metric um, to maybe help determine you know where to place products in physical proximity to each other or you know, identifying which is the next best product to, to market or suggest to a customer. Maybe given the, the marketing organization a 360 degree view of a customer that would allow for more effective marketing or even location analysis. So if we um, are, are using a geospatial tool to determine the best location for a new store or a new branch. Or maybe we use that geospatial analysis to identify where we can cut costs. Um, so, so looking to that tool for, for where maybe the market is saturated or, or where we have some redundancies. Uh, we talked about optimizing inventory or labor or supply chain. Uh, again, those are for most organizations, some of the biggest area of expense. Um, so it stands to reason that if we can make a you know, quote unquote good decision in those areas, that's gonna end up saving the organization some money and potentially some really significant money. So one of our customers uh, is Citi, the, the financial services and kind of retail banking firm. And we implemented a, a geospatial mapping solution for them they wanted to have a view of their locations relative to their customers uh, to gain an understanding of you know, how far their customers need to travel to get to the nearest branch. Uh, the solution also, of course, provided a view of which areas were underserved. So in other words, where some potential areas are for expansion for them. So through this solution, they ended up being able to map their competitors' branches as well. Uh, so they could see then not just how far their own customers were from their branches, but how far their customers were from their competitor branches and maybe how many of their competitor branches their customers needed to walk past just to get to one of their own branches. One of the features of that solution that ended up bringing a wow factor to the organization was the ability to leverage a street view to see things like parking capacity and drive through access, and maybe just the presentation of the storefront to passersby of both their own branches as well as their competitors. Again, that's an opportunity where, uh, or a, you know, a use case where they were able to reduce some manual effort and actually going to make those site visits instead they could rely on. Um, mapping tool to a certain extent. And there's another company that we work for. It's based in the Midwest. It's a logistics provider. Uh, so we built a data warehouse for them that brought together data from the multiple uh, systems that they had acquired or inherited through multiple acquisitions over the years. So for this logistics company, the efficiency of their truckloads as well as the efficiency of their routes were critical to driving profit. Having all the data consolidated allowed them to optimize across the entire company and opened up new opportunities to consolidate loads and minimize mileage, et cetera. And it represented a, a significant cost savings for the company. So the final paradigm for presenting BI and analytics as a real um, you know, business value uh, would be thinking about data or your analytics as a source of revenue. So have you ever considered whether your data or analytics tools would have value outside of your organization? Maybe to the partners, maybe to organizations and kind of ancillary markets, or maybe even to your competitors. So it sounds crazy, but it's, but other companies, other organizations are monetizing the assets of their data or of their analytics solution. So there's multiple ways really to, to profit from that internal asset. 
uh, whether it's providing raw data, uh, whether it's providing an analytics tool, or, or maybe just simply some kind of fixed reports. But it takes the mentality that data is an actual asset, and that that asset is every much an asset as your physical inventory, if you're a retailer, for example, or as the collective knowledge of your employees, if you're a services firm. And it assumes that you've reached a certain level of maturity with that analytics capability. Um, the quality and sophistication of your data and tools is certainly paramount to providing value to others outside the organization. And that's something that we're all working on generally uh, anyway, which is good. So retailers have been doing this uh, for many years by sharing sales data of categories that they then ask their vendors to manage. Um, so you know, part of what they get in return is uh, the, you know, the, the additional effort or the manpower in managing that portion of the store, that category of the store. So Educause is one of our clients and they're an organization that serves the higher education market. So think colleges and universities, uh, community colleges, et cetera. And one of their services gives member organizations insights into what other organizations or institutions have done with respect to many aspects of IT. So such as you know, their you know, other organizations spend on an annual basis, maybe their FTE count or their org structure, um, maybe you know, overall compensation. Uh, and you know, it really helps to inform their member organizations of some strategic planning in IT and, and helps uh, their members build the case for, for new initiatives. Uh, so while, you know, so what they do is through a series of surveys multiple times every year, they uh, voluntarily collect information from their members and then they publish that data back out to their members. Uh, so again, it gives each of their members um, a bit of a perspective on what similar institutions are doing uh, throughout the country. They're not strictly competing, um, you know, in a for-profit sense, um, but you know, they essentially are competing for the same students. So also with this solution, then they are able to monitor the usage of the tools. Uh, for each of their member organizations. Uh, and that then gives them a perspective of which of their members are taking advantage of this valuable resource and which ones maybe aren't and need to be encouraged to get a little bit more value out of their membership to the group. Okay, so let's, let's transition to some recommendations on building a business case uh, for BI that, uh, um, it would be for, for your benefit here. So when we think about the, the general or the high level calculation for ROI, it's, it's really profit minus expense divided by expense times 100. So we, we want it in terms of you know, percentage. And so, um, so we, we've talked a lot about the, the project benefit or the, um, the profit side of things, uh, but it's important to also factor in the cost side of things. Um, so, you know, perhaps you've all been thinking, yeah, 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 all these benefits are great, uh, but there certainly has been a cost, there's been an effort, uh, there's been an expense to actually drive that benefit. And if you've been thinking that, you're, you're absolutely right. So there's gonna be costs in things like, uh, you know, subscription fees or hosting fees. Um, certainly, you know, we would encourage things like end user training and enablement on any new solution or new tool that gets implemented. Possibly for, for organizations, there's a cost around bringing in external data to, to supplement the data that an organization has internally. And certainly, um, you know, bringing in external expertise, you know, analytics aid certainly represents a cost to our clients in terms of building out some of these tools. 
But ideally, those costs are going to hit certainly upfront. They're going to hurt. Uh, they're going to hit in the first year or two. Uh, but then after that point, in you know, if we've built a, a business case for a situation or a solution that actually has business value, we're going to see the benefit then extend multiple years into the future. Uh, and so with that upfront investment, you know, over time, we're expecting to see, you know, on a given project or a given client, a given situation, we're expecting them to see, um, you know, a benefit that far outweighs uh, what the initial investment was in the solution. So one of the things that is important to note here when you're building a business case are your assumptions, your assumptions about the return on investment. So it's, it's important to, to think about things like, your, you know, think about assumptions related to vendor support. Uh, so, you know, what are, you know, to what extent are you assuming your technology vendor is going to participate in the project? Or, you know, to what extent will they have a stake in the solution? And maybe that's something that you can mit mitigate by having them participate in a steering committee, for example. Another assumption to make sure that you're thinking about is around your workforce turnover. Um, so are you expecting more or less turnover in the next you know, one year or three years, five years? Um, and if so, what are you going to do from a training and an onboarding perspective? So it's important to be thoughtful about things like that uh, that might otherwise fall through the cracks and then kind of catch you by surprise into the project. Um, so if we think about them up front, we can plan for them and build them in to the financial projection. Another topic um, around which to think about your assumptions is the operationalization of insights. <laughs> Difficult to say. Um, so you know, to what extent are you going to bake into business processes uh, the usage of insights that will come from the solution? Of course, we all want to avoid providing a great solution that just sits on the shelf or is underutilized. Uh, and so how will you encourage users to actually make decisions based on insights that come from the new tool? Uh, it's similar, kind of a you know, corollary to uh, the em enablement of impacted staff. Uh, so you know, how will you train? How will you encourage? How will you get on board uh, any of the end users of this solution. A lot of times that's easier said than done and certainly one of the uh, trickier aspects of building BI and analytics. So there's also, by the way, some common ROI calculation gotchas, uh, some problems to watch out for. So it's easy to make the ROI calculations look more rosy than they actually are. Uh, so we have to be realistic with our expectations. Uh, we also have to make sure that we've covered all the possible or likely costs. Uh, nothing can erode the confidence of a decision maker than a financial case that is weak or that is easy to break, uh, easy to see through, it's too optimistic, it's incomplete. Uh, so we need to do our due diligence, even if it means our upfront costs are a little bit higher. Um, you know, we, we want to pre uh, present an accurate picture to those decision makers and then let them do their jobs, which is to, to make decisions that benefit the organization for the long term. So always important to start simple uh, when you're building a business case. Uh, you know, look for use cases that have a straightforward business value. So we hit a couple of those up front around reducing costs. Uh, in IT as well as in the business. I think it's also important to consider the evolution of the solution. Uh, so again, we're starting small, but then maybe over time we're building onto that solution. Uh, the, the effort and the cost built onto that solution is gonna be lower than the original investment, uh, but maybe we add on users. Um, you know, we, we increase the tool access or we add in additional data, additional markets, additional segments. Maybe we build out additional metrics or data elements that are displayed in the tools over time. And so I think it's also really important to 
define the key metrics that will be measured with the new solution. Um, you know, a lot of times we can take a snapshot of what those metrics are uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, at the end of the project, and then into the future uh, so that we can really prove out that what we were trying to improve within the organization with this solution uh, was actually improved. So just a, a quick word here as we, as we wrap things up here on the intangible benefits. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's really easy to, to speak to some of these benefits, which are, are certainly important. Um, but if we're talking about building a business case, we, we need to be very, very careful about some of these benefits that are difficult to quantify financially. So certainly we encourage to communicate some of these intangible benefits. Uh, we can explain them, you know, within the context of the business case. Um, you know, we can give as many details of them, you know, such as the, the quantification of them or the measurement of them. Um, you know, we just need to avoid the implication that there's a financial benefit tied to, for example, increased customer satisfaction or an increased staff satisfaction. It's great, of course, we all want uh, faster and more accurate information just very, very difficult to actually tie that to a financial benefit for the organization. So I'm not saying that these things can't be measured. Of course, I mean, customer SAT can be measured with a customer poll or, or some sort of feedback mechanism. Um, you know, staff access to data can be measured with, you know, adoption rate or usage rate. Um, so again, those are all those are all good, you know, great benefits. Uh, they're just difficult to tie to a financial benefit or financial impact. So, um, you know, I do want to uh, to give you the good news that that there is a calculator that can help kind of automate this process for you, um, and uh, and we will be sending that out uh, after this webinar. Uh, and so, feel free to, uh, to to leverage that as a starting point. You know, it certainly doesn't make any promises, doesn't make any guarantees, um, and always important to uh, to double check the math that's, that's baked in. Uh, maybe yours ends up being a little bit different, uh, but we will give you a great starting point. And, and certainly, you know, if there's a conversation around an upcoming investment uh, that you want to have with us, we're, of course, happy to, uh, to help in any way that we can. So the, the final word here is, that no project has an automatic right to approval and you know, an automatic right to budget. Um, decisions to invest in BI and analytics projects are always gonna compete with broader needs of the organization, you know, other proposals from whether it's different business areas or, or IT. But you're gonna give your yourself the best chance of getting that approval, getting that funding when you focus on initiatives that are aligned to the strategic direction of the organization. Um, you know, but proving out that the financial benefit should be easier, getting the attention of leaders and decision makers should be easier in that situation as well. Um, so we wanna encourage you to, to start there um, and really build out what that financial case is uh, in, the, in your situation. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful and I uh, look forward to fielding follow-up questions here uh, after the webinar. Thank you very much. Cool, thanks Dave. And uh, just a couple closing remarks. Thanks again everyone so much for joining. Uh, like Dave said, we did, uh, we recorded this. I think someone asked that question too. So we did record this. I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone that contains a link to the recording in case you want to listen to it later or send it to anyone. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thanks again for joining and I hope that you all have a great day. Thanks. Bye.